He said, don't ever, never ever stretch your eyes and look at people with what the furnishings we've given them from this worldly life. To learn engineering, law, uh, science, all these things with Islam, with Islam. These have to be learned as well. It's a fard kifaya. Don't look at the people above you. Look at the people below because it's more befitting that you do that so you don't look down upon the ni'mah of Allah which He gave you. He said, look at the likes of Kisra and Qaisr. Look at the shan and shokat they've got. The palaces, the kingdom, the wealth, what they had was unparalleled in that time of Islam in, in, in the history. He mentions, O oh, Umar, Ama tarda an takuna lahumud dunya wa lana al akhirah? You know what? Lahumud dunya, they've got the dunya and we've got the akhirah. That's why they're in deception and we're not. Honorable and respected brothers and elders. Any, everyone sitting here wants to achieve success. Everyone wants to be successful. And whether you are running a business, whether you have a job, whatever you do, everyone wants to achieve success. And it's for that reason why we do the things which we particularly do. Success is not something which is common amongst human beings, it's also amongst the animal kingdom as well. Okay, insan thinks rationally, animals don't think as rationally. Whereas, as I mentioned to you a couple of weeks ago, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, فَمَنْ زُحْزِهَا عَنِ النَّارِ وَأُدْخِلِ الْجَنَّةِ فَقَدْ فَاز If you want to know asal what your kamiyabi is, if I ask any Muslim, any Muslim, if I say, brother, what's success? Tell me what is success? He should automatically say, if I get safe from Jahannam and go Jannah, that's, that's success, Alhamdulillah. But we do understand and appreciate that there's nothing wrong with being successful in terms of the dunya. Here's the key question. What is success? How do we define success? If I ask you, what is a failure? Can you define a failure? Because a failure is not something physical you can touch. You can show me jacket, you can show me hat, you can show me stand, paper. It's not something physical. It's something intangible. What that means is, if I say to you, show me, show me fear, show me hope, show me anger. You can show me an angry person, but you can't physically show me these things. These are words. Success and failure are words. We all attach a different meaning to those words. So someone who's living, for example, in the village somewhere, Wallahu alam, in the world, whether it be Africa, Asia, South America, wherever, uh, someone who's in the village, for him to have two bits of food a day and clean drinking water and a shelter over his head, he may think that's successful for me. Whereas someone who's a millionaire, who owns a chain and fleet of businesses, a fleet of cars, houses and properties, because they're constantly looking at the people above, they will always look at themselves as a failure. So what, as Muslims, we have to define and draw the line. Okay, for us, success is akhirah, number one. If dunya comes as well, then alhamdulillah, of course, no one wants to be poor. But what I'm trying, to, I'm trying to get you to think is, what do you define as success? When we say, mashallah that person lived a very successful life. What do we mean by success? What do we mean by failure? He was a failure. What is a failure exactly? So as Muslims, we need to kind of understand that unfortunately, what dictates, what dictates our choices, what makes us make our mind is unfortunately a thing of which we refer to as greed. Many of us, unfortunately, we don't have, we have ample means, but we have something which is called greed, hirs. And that, unfortunately, will never ever finish. A person's greed can never ever finish because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he mentions, لو كان لابن آدم وادية من ذهب أحب أن يكون له واديا. If you were to give one of the sons of Adam a valley of gold, now what's a valley? Mountain, mountain, and all the space in between is the valley. Fill it up as much as the mountain and give it to somebody and say, brother, there you go, there's gold. What do you think he'll do? Will he say, Alhamdulillah, now I can retire in Silat and Dhaka, mashallah, in defense, and I can buy a house and relax and mashallah, have a fleet of boats and every now and then go fishing with the family and have some fun or go hunting now and then? Let's be realistic. What would the person say? I've got one, now I'm getting a second one. And the hadith mentions if he was to have two, لَبْتَغَى ثَالِثَ He'll say, now I want a third one. What is the thing that will fill the stomach of this son of Adam? The hadith mentions only the mud of the grave. That's the only thing that will curtail and stop his desires. So we understand from this hadith that this is a forever challenge, my brother. You're always going to be running after wealth. There's never going to point in your life where you're going to say, that's enough. It, it won't happen. 
Look at the likes of Bill Gates. Look at the likes of Bezos. If you don't know who that geezer is, he's the geezer that owns Amazon. I mean, he just sprung up to 116 billion out of nowhere. One of the wealthiest people in the world. And the gap between first and second is mammoth. And he's set to become one of the, I mean, sort of crazy rich. And then you have people like Andrew Carnegie, who in his time, he mentioned he's probably one of the richest people in, in modern day history, which we know and how much he developed and how much he earned. Did it stop him from earning more? It was a constant hiss and it was just a never ending struggle. We need to, as Muslims, take a step back. There's nothing wrong with running businesses. I mean, the likes of Abdurrahman ibn Awf, radiallahu anhu, who's a Sahabi, and he's a person who Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in one majma, one gathering, he said, Abu Bakr fil Jannah, Umar fil Jannah, Uthman fil Jannah, Ali fil Jannah, 10 people, and Abdurrahman bin Awf fil Jannah. So he assured him that you're going Jannah. He was one of the most richest of Sahaba. But yet when someone came in a, dele a, a, a dele delegation to see him, they couldn't tell from the workers to the people, to the layman, to anyone. He was amongst them. They had to ask, sorry, who's, who's Abdurrahman? Who's Abdurrahman? When delegation would come to me, Umar radiallahu anhu, they, would, they were expecting to see a Khalifa in a big palace. They found someone in the sihan of the masjid with a brick as a pillow. And they said, that's the Amir al-Mu'mineen. They were shocked. That's, the, that's Umar, that's the ruler of the two, you know, of, the, of such a big, how many population of the world at that time? Rob. And that's why Rob went in these people. They were so affected that they were just, they would rock hearts. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs things in the Quran. So you and I take sabak from. He addresses Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who never had no talab for dunya. So don't think, na'uzu billah, he was telling him because he had it. No, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was offered the best choice of women, the best money from Quraysh. And he said, you can put the sun in my right hand, moon in my left. I will not stop calling unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, so let's not think that this verse was revealed because by there's something, that's what some people will tell you who don't study Quran and Hadith properly. But na'uzu billah, it's not like that. This is education for you and I. He mentions to him, Allah Ta'ala sends a verse down. وَلَا تَمُدَّنَّ عَيْنَيْكَ إِلَى مَا مَتَعْنَا بِهِ أَزْوَاجًا مِّنْهُمْ زَحْرَضَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا لِنَفْتِنَهُمْ فِي وَرِزْقُ رَبِّكَ خَيْرٌ وَأَبْقَى He said, don't ever, never ever stretch your eyes and look at people with what the furnishings we've given them from this worldly life, the zahr al hayat dunya Don't ever do that. Why have we given this? لِنَفْتِنَهُمْ fi. We've given it as a fitna and a test and a trial for them. But then to give some tasalli, you may feel it sometimes naturally. If, you, if, you, if you're driving around in a banger and you see someone pull up in a Maserati or a Ferrari or some next level G-Wagon, you're going to think, oh, brother, I'm struggling to get the MOT for my car. And I mean, I've got, it's a banger that constantly going in and out of the garage. You're going to feel it a little bit. We're human beings. But Allah to give you tasalli, what does he say? وَرِزْقُ رَبِّكَ خَيْرٌ وَأَبَقَى What is in provision with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The provisions of Allah is better and everlasting than what you can see in this worldly life. That's what we have to try and aspire for. Kitalo Sa'ad with Alhamdulillah, you know, we do our thing. I don't say, I never ever discourage anybody to leave their business, their job or anything. I encourage Muslims to get into the best jobs, academic jobs, to, to take further the ummah, take further. This is a fardi kifaya to learn engineering, law, uh, science, all these things. With Islam, with Islam, these have to be learned as well. It's a fardi kifaya. So for me to say, do you know, everyone become Mulbi Sab. Well, how's that going to help? Let's just say everyone here was a Molana. What does that help? We need people to go into different fields. And then in Kaduka from them, we have a specialization of people who study the deen. So that's what I advocate. Because people have this thing in it, Maulvi Sahab Yar is gonna tashkil to go to Jamaat for 40 days, four months, and mashallah always, you know, just sit in masjid with Allah, 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 just with a tasbih. Brother, let's be realistic. That's a part of deen, it's not the be all and end all of deen. Okay? So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was sent this verse to instruct us. Don't ever look at the, the don't stretch your eyes towards the things we've given to the people. And if it happens, which is you're human beings, you're gonna sometimes see someone with something, you're gonna say, Yar. You know what I mean? I wish I had that. Or I wouldn't mind having that. This is why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, excuse me, Abu Hurair radiallahu anhu mentions in the hadith, انظروا الى من اسفل منكم ولا تنظروا الى من هو فوقكم فهو اجدر الا تزدروا نعمة الله Don't ever look at people who are above you. Look at the people who are below you. 
This is a hadith, Sahih Muslim. Don't look at the people above you, look at the people below, because it's more befitting that you do that, so you don't look down upon the ni'mah of Allah which He gave you. If you have only one bit of roti a day, or one, I don't know, item of food a day, and someone has two to three, you're going to perhaps look at them. Someone who has one house is going to look at someone with two. Someone with five businesses is going to look at someone with ten. The millionaire is going to look at the billionaire, the billionaire is going to look at the super billionaire, and all the super billionaires are looking at Bezos. So this is what it's like. When this hirs will never finish. So what did Rasulullah say? Because when you have a lot, and then you start looking above, you start saying, yeah, look what I've got, man, look what I've got. You know, without mentioning too much, there's one brother who I met, and I said he's either going to die of a depression or a heart attack, one of the two. Bichara, not that we wish it, I hope Allah gives him a long, healthy life, but he always, const- and sitting with him, sitting with some people is so depressing. Like, all he talks about is money. And look how much money they've got, look how much, look, look at them and look at us. And I'm saying, brother, mashallah, thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's a relative, like he's somehow related, so, you know what I mean, like, we can't tell him to do one as well, we're kind of stuck. But he, it's like, always, yeah, change the subject for God's sake, change something else, talk about something different. <laughs> Always the same stuff that look what they've got, look what they've got. You, my dear brother, are going to live a very shallow life if you keep on looking at other people. Because your success is based on other people, not what you feel within. So you are forever going to be a failure, even if you inherit the wealth of the world. Because when you do it, okay, let's say this. I put a million pound in your hands right now. How does that make a real difference to you as a person? How does it, how does it make a difference to you as a person? What, does it, what automatically happens within you that now makes you successful? It's all there. It's not, it's not about anything else. It's not in the pocket. It's all in the mind. Will you change your attitude? Will you change your nature? If you think, say you would, then you're a fake. Straight up fake. Then we need to think who we really are. Because money doesn't make an individual. Once Umar radiallahu anhu went to see Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he separated himself from his wives because there was a bit of ikhtilaf. He actually issued a divorce. Long story, and I can't go into it at this moment, but I'll just mention the khulasa. He meant, went in to see the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Umar, and he mentions, إِنَّهُ لَعَلَى حَصِيرٌ بَيْنَهُ وَبَيْنَهُ مَا بَيْنَهُ وَبَيْنَهُ شَيْءٌ I went to see Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم. There was nothing between him and, you know these what they call chatai? Straw mats? Yeah? You see them in Asian, I haven't really seen them anywhere else. They're like straw mats on the floor. They're, not, they're like the equivalent of carpets. So he, meant he was laying on one of those. And he mentions, تَحْتَ رَأْسِهِ وَسَادَ Beneath his head there was a pillow, but it wasn't an ordinary pillow. Min Adam, it was a pillow made of leather, hashwaha leaf, it had, it had leaves inside. So that was the pillow of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then it, what happened was, by his feet there was what? Qaradhan masbuga. there were like leaves that they would use for coloring. Near his head there were hanging water skins. When Umar radiallahu anhu, he sees him in this state, and he sees that, I saw athar al-hasir ala jambi, I saw fi jambi, I saw the, the print of the chatai on his body. And he started crying. So Rasulullah sallallahu said to him, Ma yubki, what, what are you crying for? And then he answered, he said, O Prophet of Allah, inna kisra wa kaysara, huma fihi ma ma fi wa anta Rasulullah. He said, look at the likes of kisra and kaysar. Look at the shan and shokat they've got. And I'm now adding my part. The palaces, the kingdom, the wealth, what they had was unparalleled in that time of Islam in, in, in the history. Look what they've got. And look what you've got. You are the Prophet of Allah. There's two hadith, but one mentions also hadith sahih as well. He mentions to him, subhanAllah, he mentions, O oh, Umar, أَمَا تَرْضَ أَن تَكُونَ لَهُمُ الدُّنْيَا وَلَنَا الْآخِرَةِ Umar, he mentioned this in this hadith. In another hadith, he mentioned, are you still in deception? Are you in deception or something? He's addressing Umar. Umar is crying when he's seeing him. And he's saying, you're the prince of both worlds here in the Akhirah. You look, at, look at how you're living in comparison to Kisra and Qaysar. You should be living a better life. He said, are you in doubt or something? You know what? لَهُمُ الدُّنْيَا They've got the dunya and we've got the akhirah. That's why they're in deception and we're not. Look at how Rasulullah made tarbiyah of his sahaba. Subhanallah, every time they would kind of wither, he would bring them back. Now I know time's gone over, but I'll just mention quickly a couple of things what we can do. Okay, some i'la, some ilaj, some cure, something to help us. Number one, as I mentioned, don't ever look at people above you. انظروا إلى من أسفل منكم Look at those who are below you. This is number one. We should always be in a habit of thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all the ni'am and blessings which He has given us. Some blessings we even take for granted. Even something like cold water, subhanallah, what a ni'mah. 
even been able to urinate properly without stones inside. I know one brother who was struggling for three to four years because he had bichara hemorrhoids, bawasir. So you see, these are all ni'mas which we take for granted. Only when we lose something, we, ah, man, them days were better. Them days were better. That's why we need to make qadr and value of these particular blessings. Contemplate daily that if you are greedy, you will never find peace. Make this muhasaba. Make this muhasaba. If I let greed get the most of me, the better of me, I will never find peace and comfort. Look at people who are below. Number two, make thanks every day for the blessings Allah has given you. Think and make muhasaba every single day. And fourthly as well, is that we have to increase our a'mal and do something more and more for the deen. Salah, dhikrullah, Qur'an, thinking of mawt and death. Death for us is not a gloomy subject. It's not something which we shy away from. It's not something which we feel scared to think about. For us, it's okay. Because al-mawt jasarun yusilu al-habib ila al-habib. You know, death is like a bridge that just takes us to the beloved, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's okay. Of course, we will leave behind love, beloved, but we're going to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and that's, for us, that's, you know, that's not, it's nothing to be afraid of. If when we get leave in this dunya in such a way where we, our a'mal aren't correct, that's something to worry about. So these are the four things. Looking at those who are below you, thinking every day, thanking Allah for the blessings which He has given you on a daily basis, thinking the harms of greed, that if I let this get the most of me, then it's going to be harmful for me. And number four, increasing our a'mal. It's a simple solution, but it's an effective solution. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq to make amal and practice and to be able to bring this within our lives. Ka'ab ibn Malik radiyallahu anhu mentions, مَا ذِئْبَانْ جَائِعَانْ أُرْسِلَ فِي غَنَمٍ بِأَفْسَدَ لَهَا مِنْ حِرْسِ الْمَرْءِ عَلَى الْمَالِ وَالشَّرَفِ لِدِينِ If you get two hungry wolves, بِرْيَا Hungry wolves, and you throw them into a pen of sheep, what's going to happen? He's going to turn them, he's going to eat them up, mash them up, cut them up. Yeah? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa mentioned, if you send two hungry wolves into a pen, they can't do as much damage for the deen as someone who has this always desire for earning wealth and money and also wanting a high position in society. That is more harmful for the deen than sending two hungry wolves into a pen. Just think and ponder over that for a second. May Allah, Allah give us tawfiq to make amal and practice. May He inspire and may He always make us those people who are thankful for the ni'mas which He has given us. Allah Ta'ala inspire us, inshallah. Subhanallah wa bihamdi, subhanakallah wa bihamdi,